Hey, what's up everybody? It's Chris here. So today I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, which is this paper, Generative Agents, Interactive Simulacra of Human Behavior. That's right, simulacra. We're going for, uh, we're going for the fun words now. In essence, this is a paper put out by Stanford and Google, and what it comes down to is it is a simulation with 25 agents. These agents are powered by LLMs and they exist in this environment and that's it. It's like a, you know, it's like the Sims on steroids, right? Basically each of these little characters or agents has some kind of task list that it likes to go through or routine. And while it's doing that, it can interact and discuss with other agents. Uh, they can hang out. It, they have certain attributes relating to their memory or their attention. So it's really cool. Um, I want to kind of walk through the broad strokes of the paper and then show the demo, which is fantastic. As you can see, there's kind of these boxes that are describing the different things that they can do, right? So in this case, this agent is arriving at school. We have this agent, which is talking to another agent, and they're actually spreading information which is crazy. We have people asking if they can sit at the coffee table. You know, we have someone taking a walk, someone facing, I mean, the idea is that these are little Sims that just kind of go about their life doing stuff and things, and that's neat. I love the way that it's built. So let's take a look a little bit more at kind of what their setup is. So basically, this is a visual representation of what the agent sees. So they have this idea of, you know, colleges and houses and cafes and supply stores and everything else. And within those things are certain rooms or sub areas. And then within those things are certain objects. Now, the way that the agent remembers this is basically they remember the world state and then they remember the children of the world state, and then they remember the, uh, you know, objects within the children of the world state. So those are your houses and your, you know, your college dorms and everything like that. The specific objects, and they remember when, where they have seen them and what state they saw them in. So basically they, they keep this working memory of all of the different things that they've seen or interacted with and what was going on when they last saw or interacted with those things. So it's kind of similar to how we might imagine going about a day, right? We go to the coffee table, we see Bob there, we go to our home, we see, you know, this, the table is in a mess or something. So it, it, it's similar to that. It's not exactly analogous, but it's similar to that. So basically, they set up each agent with this initial paragraph. In the initial paragraph, they, you know, make some broad statements about the agent, who they are, what they do, you know, where they live. Uh, and it is a fantastic little setup. And that's really all that they have to worry about. Now, the agents are, of course, also able to communicate with each other. And they do this in natural language. So, you know, when, when one agent talks to another, they parse it and they return a response in natural language. Of course, using large language models as a medium to do. That. Also, it's really fun because in the sandbox, they show what they're doing in this emoji summary. So like, as you can see here, we have this, this book pencil for writing in a journal and we have this computer message for writing an email. So that's always fantastic. If we scroll down, you can also see that the you can actually interact with these agents as they're going on about their day. We'll look at the demo in a second and see, you know, kind of what that looks like and, and how we might interact, but you can just kind of speak thoughts into their head and kind of, you know, figure out what they're going to do or tell them what to do. So in, in a way it's like the Sims, right? Except you're interfacing with it through natural language as opposed to like clicking buttons or right clicking or whatever like that. There are also the ability kind of a la like early Sim City, uh, you know, you can actually like kind of tamper with the environment. So the example they give is you can change the oven status from being turned on to burning, uh, which is 
which is rather cruel, but uh, hey, it is what it is. If you do that, however, the agent is going to interact with that particular updated state. And then, of course, they're going to, if it's necessary, remember the object in that state going forward. And as you can see, of course, the agents talk to each other. And one of my favorite parts, because of the fact that these agents have memory, is that they actually pass the information on to other agents, right? So you have this kind of spread or dissemination of information throughout the uh, simulation, which is really interesting. I think at larger scales, if we were to simulate more and more and more agents, might be useful to understand or better describe how actual language propagates through a, a population. So very interesting stuff so far. Uh, and we're not even at the good stuff yet. So ho you know, hold on to your hat. And here we see a more visual representation of kind of the day in the life of an agent. Uh, you know, they wake up, brush their teeth, they take a shower, they start cooking breakfast, you know, they catch up with some friends, they do some packing, and they begin their work day. I mean, it's, you know, it goes on and on. It's fantastic, though, because it really shows that you can build these kind of complex simulations. You know, this is maybe an obscure reference, but I'm, I'm, I'm brought back to kind of when the people who developed Oblivion, this is a Elder Scrolls game for those who don't know, set up AI that had routines and went about their day and they could have kind of these little emergent interactions. You know, one of the agents was set up with this idea of having a party. And throughout the course of the simulation, they managed to tell people about the party, those people remembered about the party, and then they got together and had the party. Right. So this is like this is incredibly interesting. You know, the sky's the limit when it comes to what this is going to enable us to do or simulate or or even just, you know, speaking from a entertainment point of view. You know, this is excellent kind of content in terms of, you know, maybe for a video game or for some kind of like living world channel or something. It's just really impressive to see what you can do with these agents and if you set them up and let them interact and you know go on adventures and this and that i mean it's just incredible uh, another awesome behavior is that they remember each other and they remember what each other is doing right so so not not only does you know in this case they're talking about uh sam right not only does sam meet uh, Latoya and then interact with her but then sam has memories specific to Latoya, right so just like uh, you would imagine if you meet someone and they're like, oh, I'm working on this cool thing. And then the next time you see them, it's like, oh, I remember this person was working on this cool thing. It's the same kind of interaction. And again, this is just so interesting because it, it just there's so many possibilities. For the actual Valentine's Day party, like they had to coordinate, you know, they had to set everything up. So basically the way this works is it kind of works similar to a knowledge base that you would create using something like Langchain or Llama Index where each agent has this memory stream, which is a index of some kind. And what happens is as they are moving forward, they are going to perceive something or see something or, you know, uh, respond to some feedback. And that's going to cause them to look through their memory stream. When they look through their memory stream, which is that retrieval process, they're going to act based on what's in their memory stream. Now, as well throughout the day, they're able to plan using the memory stream. So this means they're able to collect relevant information from their memory stream and create plans. And then they put those back into their memory stream. And then they're able to also reflect on kind of groupings of their memory streams in order to condense and summarize higher level thoughts or concepts. I mean, it's ba like, like this is basically... <laughs> This sounds so silly, but it's basically just like, you know, like talk to your documents using Langchain. But each of those documents is a memory stream as opposed to like some PDFs that you have hanging around. So it's really the architecture isn't groundbreaking, but it's being applied in such a novel and interesting way that it's it's so interesting to think and and, and talk about. So to talk a little bit more about that retrieval process, there are three basic scores that are taken into consideration when the agent is required to create a response. So as input, it takes this query, and then over the memory stream, it calculates three things. That's recency, 
importance, and relevance. So the recency score is calculated using exponential decay as you elapse hours in the simulation, uh, and the factor there is 0 0.99. Importance is just a score actually generated by the large language model itself. Um, it is asked basically on a scale of 1 to 10, how important do you think this is? And of course, we have everyone's favorite, which is relevance, cosine similarity uh, between the actual memory and the prompt. That's kind of stock. And then it's normalized and the scores are ranked and the top ranked uh, score is the one that is fed into the LLM as context for the query. So again, this is like, it's like talk to your PDF, right? But on, on another level in terms of how it's being orchestrated. So next up we have reflections. As the agent experiences important events or not so important events, right? Um, the agent is given a score, that score accumulates. And when it meets a certain threshold, the reflection triggers. What it does is it sends 100 of the most recent memories to the LLM and asks it to create some questions about those utterances. Then, using those questions, it gets a bunch of relevant documents, which can also include reflections, by the way, and it asks the agent, given these, you know, X number of, th however many things it, it, it generates during that second step, given those, what are some things we can say about this particular agent? And then it asks it to provide context. And that's what gives us that high level reflection, right? So it's basically recursively asking the agent, you know, hey, based on these memories, and then we generate questions from these memories, and then we answer these questions using the whole agent's memory stream and we get these insights about the agent at a high level right and the fact that it it, it the fact that it occurs when importance meets a certain certain threshold is fantastic because we might have either a very large number of events which is likely to lead to kind of general questions which might be about the, you know, the agent might reflect on its general day versus very like high octane important events, which the agent might reflect on very quickly after they occur, which is kind of similar to real life, right? So I mean, again, they did a really good job setting this up. I cannot undersell that. So then we get to planning. Planning is very straightforward. Uh, they ask the LLM to generate some plan. So basically they seed it and then they ask it to, gener to generate like the rest of the day's plan. And then they recursively go through and shorten time spans. So they do a broad strokes first, which they seed the LLM. And then based off of those broad strokes, they get plans for tighter and tighter time windows until they are kind of, you know, planned down to the five to 10 minute chunks. So, you know, very straightforward. Additionally, you know, they can update their plans based on what they see and what they react to. Uh, obviously, they are more likely to react or change their plans based on the idea that they want to do something else. The context summary is really important because it is there to indicate kind of, you know, how would this person react to this thing, right? Like, is this a, is this a, an event or not you know the, the example that they use in the paper is fantastic which is that an artist is unlikely to react to seeing an easel you know because that's what they're doing uh that's not going to change the plan a lot but maybe somebody comes by that they know they might want to hang out or talk to them so uh it's really it depends on kind of what these agents uh you know are up to what they're doing and they can react and change their plans as that happens, which is which is fantastic. And the rest of the paper goes on to describe kind of some more interactions and, uh, you know, little features. I, I really would just really recommend you read this. It's fantastic. Um, it's so interesting because it is a an application of AI I didn't think that I'd see today. And, uh, you know, with the speed that AI is moving, 
uh, it's maybe not surprising, but it's still it's still delightful. Um, so there is some ethical and social impact concerns here, right? So I want to take some time to talk about those. The first worry is kind of like these parasocial relationships that people can form. And so the authors have some loose guidance on you might avoid that. The second risk, of course, is this idea that, you know, errors might be problematic. And you're like, well, how are they problematic? Well, outside of the sandbox, right? So these agents could operate anywhere, really, and they can respond to anything, and they, their memory streams could be whatever. So it really depends on how it's handled, where they're implemented, what they can do. It's critical that they are supervised as much as possible in order to avoid any harms due to potential uh, misuse. That supervision extends to the third risk, in which, you know, it might exacerbate current uh, misuse of AI. It, it is definitely going to if they release anything that lets you create these agents outside of sandbox environments. So, yes, that's an important risk to consider. And of course, and of course, you know, the idea that AI could take jobs never stops being relevant. So, um, you know, that's that's the last risk. And, uh, and I think it's a, a very concrete one that a lot of people are struggling with. So it's uh, it's good that they put that into the paper. So finally we get to the demo and I'm just gonna let it play for a bit. You know, this is the, uh, this is a small snippet of the original demo. This is pre-recorded, so we can't really uh, do anything with the agents. We can't talk to them or anything. You can see down here, if we click on an agent, we get kind of this outline of them, their little emoji. Uh, you know, where they are, if they're conversing, what they're doing. We can click on state details to get a more in-depth version of what's going on. We can see some innate tendencies, some learned tendencies, uh, you know, what they're currently doing and uh, what their lifestyle is. So you have the loose daily requirements. So these are the things that this agent is going to for sure do. And then the model is able to fill in the blanks. Uh, we do have these action lists, which is like what she's doing, which is pretty neat. Uh, where the address is, what it starts at, what how long the action takes and the action description. And then this is the pronunciation, which is the emojis, which is fantastic. And then finally we have the agent's memory. And this is the big stream, you know, and it is, uh, it is pretty long, <laughs> but it is awesome. So if we go back to the simulation, we can kind of see what they're doing and they're walking around. You know, this person is showering, I presume. We've got some sleeping people. They're putting on some clothes. They're making some brekkie, you know, and we have just like, oh, someone's having to walk by. Nice. Hello. What's going on, man? And this is what they do. This is the simulation, right? It is something that seems so primitive, I think, when we first look at it. But systems like these with enough time, tinkering, fine tuning, innovation are going to be wild, right? Uh, when you think about it, each of these agents is just making API calls. Like, that's what they're doing. There's very little outside of them making API calls. And we can build this vibrant world of having this network of API calls talking to each other and interacting in a world. Um, and again, disclaimer, this isn't AGI. It's not meant to be AGI. It's just awesome, right? It's so cool. And the applications are limitless. So I encourage you to check out the full paper. It's an awesome read. Uh, I hope you have a great day. If you like the video, please like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll see you in the next one.